Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode 135 of The Team House. I'm David Park uh, with co host Jack Murphy. Um, we are, uh, tonight joining us is, uh, Aaron Schwartzbaum, um, a specialist in Russian politics, political risk, and the economy with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. So, first off, thank you very much for joining us tonight, Aaron. Uh, you know, we're kind of a last minute thing and we really appreciate you stepping in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so, Jack and I are both kind of comic nerds and one of the things we always like to ask people is, what is your origin story? Like, you're a Russian specialist. How did that happen? So, I guess two parts of this story. So, we'll go way, way, way back before I was born. Um, my mom's parents uh, are from Poland, and my mom's mom, my grandmother, during World War II, uh, fled into the Soviet Union from Poland after the invasion. Um, so, was indoctrinated heavily into Soviet propaganda, was all over the country, uh, up in the far north through Ukraine to Azerbaijan for the duration of the war. So um, she is still very interested in a lot of Russian poetry and literature. Um, so grew up a little bit around that, not the language. Um, my kind of actual interest in the language is uh, another story from uh, high school where um, I used to do fencing and I had a coach from Moscow. And kind of the long story short uh, is that it's Stockholm syndrome. Um, you know, I had grown up having American coaches, you know, oh, try that, try that a little harder. Like you got this. And he would just be like, no, not good enough. Smack me with the sword. <laughs> and then like, want to know what he was yelling. Um, it worked. Um, so I went, uh, started college and started learning Russian and kind of the rest, the rest is history. So it started with, I mean, the interest, but did it sort of start with the language and then you started delving more into the politics of it and things like that? So I've always been, um, a pretty big history nerd uh, would definitely as like a kid kindergarten, like prefer history channel to cartoons. A lot of the time, uh, World War II documentaries uh, were my kind of bread and butter. I mean, that's all they used to show, frankly. So uh, that was uh, that was kind of my my jam. Um, and yeah, so I knew I would be doing something related to like politics, international relations. Um, but the fact that it would be Russia specific uh, kind of discovered a little bit further down the road. Yeah. And so what did that look like for you in, in your undergraduate and then graduate and things like that? Yeah. Um, so kind of starting. Um, so just by coincidence, I happened to go to an undergrad program with a, a pretty good uh, Russian department. Um, so it was kind of a combination of like heavily intensive language studies and then my political science degree, uh, which was focused um, at the time when I first started um, international relations with a focus on focus on security matters, um, counter counterinsurgency specifically. I um, wrote my thesis about uh, Russia's counterinsur counterinsurgency strategy, rather, excuse me, um, in the Chechen wars. And then, yeah, the Russian was, uh, my freshman year had about uh, eight hours a week of language classes, intensive programs um, in the summer, um, and then time abroad. So I've lived in St. Petersburg about a year and a half total. Wow. Um, some pretty wild stories from there. Um, incidentally enough, uh, both times I was there and there was a good year and a half break in between them, some sort of like major political instability broke out. So the Russians uh, were kind of amused by that coincidence and had questions about what I was really doing there, which for the record was studying the language. Nothing, uh, nothing well, too shady. We'll have to get uh, one or two of those wild stories on our, uh, <laughs> yeah, on exactly. our bonus segment for our <laughs> Patreon subscribers. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, let's kind of get into the meat of it. I mean, people know that, like, the general public right now knows that there is an invasion. Russia is invading Ukraine. Can you give us a little bit of background on it? And we can go all the way back to, uh, you know... Uh, wherever, you, wherever you'd like to start, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, wherever you think it starts. Well, I mean, going all the way back to the start would take us to about, like, the 900s AD with the Kievan Rus and the formation of basically the, the kingdom and empire uh, around Kiev that would lead to the birth of Russia. So it starts in Ukraine. Um, 
Kiev is kind of the ancestral birthplace, kind of a good way to put it, of uh, Russia as a political power. And then Russia wound up essentially emerging, overshadowing the Rus. The Rus kind of fell apart. Um, but yeah, um, the Rus is, this is the same. You can hear that word, Rus in it. Uh, the fact that it's called Russia, these are interrelated. Um, so yeah, it begins a long, long time ago, but to this specific war now, kind of bringing us up to date, um, I think the real story is the fall of the Soviet Union, okay. um, bringing us back to about 1990 and um, Russia and Ukraine too, as it were, um, having a really, really rough go in the 90s, kind of falling into economic mires stagnation, depression, uh, worse than worse than stagnation. Um, and the implications that had, I think, uh, well, in Ukraine certainly um, spawned um, and gave way to a lot of corruption and stagnation that uh, the country really only had until very recently just started to make some headway on, although um, baby steps. Um, and in Russia, kind of this lingering sense of uh, embarrassment of lost empire of you know uh glory days past uh insecurity because of it and that um that translates uh kind of translates down uh from your elites from you know someone like vladimir putin who kind of watched his country fall apart from germany mm -hmm. um down to regular people and putin himself actually i think put it pretty nicely he said and i'm paraphrasing here that um like anyone who wants to return to the Soviet Union doesn't have a brain, but anybody who doesn't miss it doesn't have a heart. Mm -hmm. Not exactly that, but um, there's some nostalgia, if not for the lack of consumer goods or all of the nasty things that the Soviet Union did and um, kind of material wealth it lacked. There's some to this day nostalgia for like being a great power and being um, a critical voice uh, in the world. Um, I believe um, it was one of the Soviet foreign ministers who said that like Russia needs to be present for any major global decision. Um, and yeah, I think I wouldn't say Putin has necessarily dreamt of recreating the Soviet Union, but he has dreamt of and thought about restoring Russia's power, making it kind of an indispensable player in the world. He's, he's made comments publicly, hasn't he, about shifting to a multipolar system? Yeah, so... Um, that kind of vector or kind of string in his thinking goes back to um, the Munich uh, Security Conference, I want to say 2007, because I think it's been 15 years since that, where he talked about how Russia won't accept the further expansion of NATO East um, and talking about his view of, you know, coming multipolarity. So um, I think if we want to start zooming into like why the conflict is happening now, um, I think there's a few reasons, but um, if you ask like, among the Russian elites, basically view Ukraine as like a core security interest. Um, I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. I can share my own thoughts on the matter down the road. But if you ask them, they'll say that Ukraine is a core security interest and they couldn't um, accept the, uh, the accession of Ukraine to NATO. That would be a critical threat. Um, a lot of this has to do with, A, kind of the historical link I mentioned with the Kiev and Rus and uh, Mother Kiev is kind of the birthplace of Russian civilization. It has to do a little bit with uh, Russia's history and geography. Kind of you have the Central European plain and Russia, you know, starting in Ukraine and Poland and uh, heading east from there. There's basically no natural defenses. So uh, Russia has always sought to have a couple of buffer states to its west, right. um, you know, from uh, players, you know, Napoleon, Hitler, um, so that's part of the insecurity. Um, and they viewed um, NATO's or would say they viewed NATO's open door policy saying that, you know, Ukraine and Georgia in this case are, you know, may not be joining yet, but we can't allow that to happen. So that's what they would say is the reason that this conflict is happening. And are, are those thoughts sort of paranoid or from his viewpoint or from their viewpoint from the Russian elite, are those legitimate concerns? So, so here's the, the, the difficulty here. The answer is like, yes to both. 
So if you look at the kind of former Soviet countries, and I want to be specific, I don't mean Poland, I mean like countries that were in the Soviet Union, Baltic states, I think would be the, the best example here, um, who have joined NATO. If you look there, um, they're NATO members. I don't think NATO's ever deployed anything too menacing in those regions. You have like the Baltic Air Police Force, you have, and this is before this war started, you have uh, like yeah, air policing, as I said, um, you have rotational detachments that rotate through, but you're talking about maybe, you know, five to 10,000 Western soldiers, uh, some planes. So really not nearly enough to be threatening to Russia in any meaningful sense of the world word. But if you look at um, like Estonia to St. Petersburg, that's only a couple hours away. So I'm not saying it's a legitimate worry, mm. um, but like from the Russian perspective, like if if NATO did ever deploy troops in mass in these places and if Ukraine were to join NATO, um, you know, firing a missile from like Kiev to Moscow would take maybe half an hour. Um, again, nothing like that has ever happened deployment wise, right. but they worry that that would be a possibility. I, I've seen in Russia, um, you know, in tabloids, people talk about like America's desire to like or the west's desire to take over russia and use its natural resources um i never really figured out like what we would do with russia in that situation right. but um you know, didn't want to didn't want to challenge anyone on that yeah, yeah. i mean that, that does reach a certain level of paranoia that this idea that um you know american main battle tanks are going to roll across the steps to moscow or, or nato is going to invade russia i mean that that's like not our game plan. It never yeah. has been the game plan. So I, I get that they have security interests in in their you know periphery, but it does seem to enter an an era of paranoia somewhere along the way. So there's two things I would kind of comment here. So as far as like the legitimacy of Russian concerns, um, one thing I will say, I think NATO in the wake of the Cold War got out a little bit ahead of its skis um, in the sense that. Its initial, at its initial founding, NATO was not really an idealistic organization about democracy promotion or um, a set of ideas to hold the West together. It was very focused on security. And you had some like pretty unsavory characters in the organization, you know, Greece at the time, um, dictatorship. Um, so it was really about these security considerations. Right. Um, and in the, in the 90s and into the 2000s, um, it grew into more of an ideological organization where you would see NATO, I mean, NATO intervening in a place like Libya, Western powers or Afghanistan, which is, I mean, justified perhaps from a moral angle, but like, is that North Atlantic security anymore? Right. And that's, uh, I think, a fair question. And so what the issue became is the organization started to, I think, in part view itself as more of like a democracy promotion right. um, as an ideological organization and dangling uh, membership, this open door policy to Ukraine, to Georgia, dangling membership, but not um, as we see this week, not with the kind of inherent interest in actually being willing to protect those countries. Mm -hmm. Um, like Moscow is more willing to fight for Ukraine than Washington or Berlin is. And we're seeing that we're seeing that now. Right now, are there economic uh, or military interests in uh, aside from the, you know, the threat of uh, you know, like democracy? Isn't there like a rare earth or like there are military assets that Ukraine provides that Russia doesn't want to be closed off to? I'm not. I'm asking because I don't 100 percent know. Yeah, so traditionally, what Ukraine's biggest contribution to the Soviet Union was is agriculture, kind of the black soil and some of the most fertile lands in the world. It's going to be a big problem in the global economy now with uh, Ukrainian wheat exports and because of sanctions, um, Russian wheat exports not um, being shipped out. But that's what Ukraine is perhaps most favored for, famous for. But it, I mean, also had some pretty um, pretty advanced industries during the Soviet Union. Um, rocket motors, for one. Um, Russia had to do some shifting around after 2014 to actually like procure um, engines for its missiles, for its ICBMs. Um, Ukraine had, when the Cold War um, came to an end, um, one of the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. Not because it you know, was hoping to have nuclear weapons, but it just legacy of the Soviet Union. And 
uh, through the uh, Budapest Memorandum, uh, agreed to give them up um, in exchange for security guarantees um, from the United States and Russia. And mm -hmm. some might say, dare I make uh, too much of a hot take, that was looking back, maybe not the best idea. I, and, you know, that was something that I was actually going to ask later on. But now, since you brought it up, it's a good point. What does this say to other countries who we are trying to, you know, when we ask them to get rid of their nuclear stockpile? Uh, don't do it. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the takeaway. Like, the way to guarantee your independence is to have nuclear weapons. And that's, uh, I don't think that's a good thing for the world, but that is like the pretty unambiguous takeaway. If you're a small state with a, a powerful neighbor, uh, no offense to Ukraine, Ukraine's not a small state. Ukraine is what, like the size of Texas has 44 million people. It's like very large, second biggest European country outside of Russia. Um, but yeah, that is the kind of unambiguous takeaway that if you give, give away your nukes, um, you're going to be vulnerable. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting because they had agreements with both Russia and the United States that there would be protection if they did. And now neither one of those countries are really, I mean, the U.S., I guess, is helping in some ways, but they open themselves up. Yeah, essentially. Um, I mean, I understand the desire at the time. It, I'm sure it came with economic benefits. Sure. Um, but one thing I want to turn to, like the, with the paranoia, because I talk mm -hmm. about Russian elites um, and People say, and it's true, Russia has gone to war with Ukraine, has invaded. Um, but the question is the decision making here, because this is, I think, a particularly interesting kind of case peculiar that it's not by all reports the Russian elites who opted into this war. This seems to have originated pretty definitively with Vladimir Putin. And a lot of the issues that Russia is having now in this war, which we'll get to, um, seem to be because many players, both in government, in kind of mass media and in the military were not in the loop about Putin's actual intention here. Um, so Putin has harbored these, uh, you know, views coming from like the spy world back when, um, suspicion of the West, suspicion of things out of his control, free market economy, uh, democratic politics. Um, but what's really changed is, incidentally enough, I think COVID, where he has been reading a lot of... Um, alternative history and really like wacky, wacky literature. I mean, he wrote an article, I want to say in the middle of this year, basically like questioning Ukrainian nationality is a legitimate idea. Um, the term I used on Twitter is that he's basically high on his own supply. Like he has bought an in fully into his propaganda. So um, and Putin, during the COVID time, Putin kind of became like, you know, that aunt or uncle of yours that quarantined and read QAnon uh, posts on Facebook for uh, the duration of the quarantine. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you see, I mean, some of his speeches uh, are they're scary, to be, to be honest. Um, his speeches about, like, in the ramp up to the war, when he's declaring war, saying they're going to recognize, um, recognize uh, the independence of the separatist republics in eastern Ukraine, um, didn't even read as, like, patriotic you know, rah, rah, like we are a strong nation and we cannot permit NATO. So we are forced. I mean, he was kind of ranting. He, it seems a little deranged for lack of a, a better word. Like he, it didn't sound healthy or typical, which was yeah concerning to a, a lot of people. Do, do you have any idea where this inspiration, I mean, I kind of facetiously brought up QAnon, but I mean, it, it, are these like the things he's reading? Is it like the Alexander Dugan? Is that the guy's name in Russia? Who's like neo-fascist? Neo um, him and and others, but I think it's um, a combination of that, the combination of the fact that he over the last, probably since the last ele election cycle has basically purged all opposition um, to him. And I think that's true as far as opposition parties go, uh, but also internally. Um, there was this video uh, of him and his security council discussing actions, and it was mm -hmm. Putin sitting at this table and then like 30 feet away, an array of chairs where you had uh, um, Sergei Narishkin, who's like the head of uh, SVR, if I remember correctly, um, you know, international or foreign spy agency, get up in front of Putin. And like the guy was like stuttering in terror, you know, like making mistakes with his Russian that I sympathized with having learned the language, like mistakes I would have made a couple of years in. Um, so the implication there is very clearly that like nobody around him is telling him, hey, like, no, that's a bad idea. That's not true. So 
confirmation bias from everyone around him and then also what he's what he's been reading and he's been very isolated that's the other thing like he hasn't especially since covid been out in the world he was very like reticent to go talk to voters or do um kind of public politics um pop politics uh to like shake hands with people even before covid but since then has really been uh, essentially bunkered up hunkered down and not not meeting with people and you see it's become kind of a meme um like the length of the tables he meets leaders at um they're like 20 feet long tables it's, it looks ridiculous it is i mean I, I don't know if they do polling in russia uh but is there any indication about because at one point in time was he a fairly popular figure in russia and has has that declined increased or stayed the same yeah, so talking about his popularity, uh, it's a great question. So except for when he first started, um, he's always been um, popular. Um, and popular, I mean, in comparison to, to, the, to the West. Um, let's just say, for example, um, not you know, making this about U.S. politics, if Joe Biden, for instance, or George W. Bush or whoever had a, a presidential approval rating of 55%, that would be like a really, really strong approval rating. That's, mm -hmm. That would be like very, very popular leader. Um, Putin has um, essentially since, or for most of the last few years, um, been consistently in the, the like the low 60s. Um, and that said, it's, it's vacillated. Um, so um, last time I was in Russia, incidentally enough, um, there was some, or I guess the first time I was in Russia, 2011, uh, there was falsification of uh, parliamentary uh, parliamentary elections uh, to give United Russia. That's Putin's. He's not actually part of it, but it is the kind of the leading party in Russia. Um, falsification to secure their victory in parliamentary elections. And Putin's approval rating started to go down um, into the 50s, which, again, it, it always remained high. This is the, the kind of the running thread um, versus then um, after Russia seized Crimea, um, skyrocketed, I want to say almost hit 80% for a time. So it was really, really up there and then began to come down to earth um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the kind of the saying or the aphorism is that you can only eat patriotism for so long and Russia's economy was sputtering. Uh, the you know, people, uh, Russians, voters kind of came back down to earth. Hey, like this is not a 80% approval leader. We're back to being a 65% approval leader. And then Putin also took a measure to reform Russia's pension system um, that was very, very unpopular. Um, and that also kind of brought him down from that stratospheric level. Um, but yeah, only back down into the 60s. Now, the question is, what, what, what value does polling have in Russia? There's very good sociologists, statisticians. Um, and I forget who said this, but the joke, and I think it's like very, very illustrative, is that you know, polling about Putin's popularity in Russia is like asking people in the pickle store if they like pickles. Like, you, you can't, you, the, the polls are not comparing him to any like meaningful opposition or actually like yeah, yeah. actual possibility someone could like run against him meaningfully. So it's, it's, um, it's not truly indicative. At the same time, it'd be, I'd be really hard pressed to say there was any like threat to, um, threat to Putin now that like necessitated him. Like, whoa, we got to distract the public. We got to go into Ukraine because I'm going to, lose power if not yeah it, it reminds me of you know walking around damascus and asking people if they support president assad or not i mean everyone knows what the right answer to that question is uh, there, there's not a whole lot of you know the left and right limits are or you know yeah. it's just part of the social norm they they know what the right answer is to give you the question is and this is like particularly interesting to me is is the why now mm -hmm. um because and that's the thing that there's not a good answer here. Um, it's baffling to a lot of people. Like Russia wasn't under like a particular threat. Um, you know, I could see if Ukraine tested a ballistic missile that it had developed domestically. Like that's the reason, okay, like they're going to field this soon. We need to go in before that's a possibility. Or, or, or if we really were going to admit Ukraine into NATO, but they weren't even eligible as long as he's holding Crimea and in parts of eastern Ukraine. So, I mean, that wasn't so, a possibility. No diplomatic moves um, at all in that capacity. Yeah. Um, so nothing there. Um, then there's like the possibility of like, 
Ukraine had gotten some new weapons, you know, kind of the uh, Bayraktar Turkish drones, um, was working on a anti-ship cruise missile, the Neptune is called. But like, those are kind of tactical innovations. Like none of those are enough to like, actually constitute a meaningful threat to, to Russia in any way. So then the question is, okay, was there something, um, was there something about the, the West that like made it like, made it him think made Putin think he had an opportunity and like, yeah, COVID some you know, protests in Western capitals kind of malaise that like maybe would, maybe would like prevent a, a meaningful response um, to spill the tea. And we were just talking about uh, streaming slang, um, but uh, the kind of the rumor intelligence and this is completely unfounded, but people are saying that it may be because Putin is sick in a significant way. And it feels like he has a limited amount of time to achieve his aims. But even if that's not true, maybe for you know, personal reasons, um, he's trying to step back from politics generally, um, maybe slowly. And he viewed this as kind of his last unsolved question that like he needs to resolve the Ukraine question and do it now, potentially before like the military balance, you know, started to swing against Russia. Although again, Nothing in particular was really happening on that front. So yeah, why now is a great question. I don't think we have a, a good answer to it. Do you, how much did like China's kind of recent, you know, like in February, the recent ties with Russia, like, do you think that that influenced this at all or gave, you know, do you think there was a wink and a nod, like, yeah, like we got you or anything like that? So it depends what you mean. Like, at least as far as I read, China actually asked Russian leaders to delay the invasion um, until after the Olympics. Um, but China has business interests in Eastern Europe. Um, and I don't think China was like goading by any stretch, goading Russia into um, into attacking Ukraine. I think this is a Russia centric, Russia, Russia centric move, Putin's decision personally. Um, and China's, I mean, tried to maintain they still have a very strong shared interest in reducing the United States as kind of our relative influence worldwide. But I wouldn't say China's been like cheerleading what Russia's uh, right. done. And I mean, abstains from the security council resolution condemning, condemning Russia's action. Um, so yeah, I don't think they initiated by any stretch this by this. And I don't think it has came from like Russian military elites or Russian political elites. I think this is like Putin himself's brainchild. And it's, it's funny saying that because I've said for so many years with so many things in Russian politics that like one of the kind of memes in Western analysis and understanding is that Vladimir Putin is personally controlling like everything that happens in Russia, every decision that gets made, every law that's passed is Putin behind the wheel. Um, and I would always say, no, that's, that's not true. There's a team, there's technocrats, there's ministries, but like this time it genuinely seems to be the case that this was actually Putin's initiative. For for you and other Russian analysts, was there was there a consensus about whether he would or wouldn't invade? Like, what was was there a general thought about that? Um, I think the answer is yes, and the answer is that most uh, most people were wrong. Um, I was it's wrong, interesting. by the way. Yeah, I, I think. Well, I didn't think it was going to happen. There's a human, there's like a human like cognitive bias against like thinking about horrible things. I mean, you see these like newspaper articles come out about like how in trouble the world is with global warming. Like, oh, like here's what's going to, I, I scroll past that. I don't want to read that. That's scary to think about. So like, A, people don't consider things they don't want to happen. Um, I think what you see though is uh, the two people who, um, who did get this right, or two of the more well-known people who got this right, who I will name drop. So um, Mike Kaufman um, and Rob Lee, who you can find on Twitter, um, both saw Russia over the course of this year. And then especially in late in the winter, um, dramatically ramping up um, a military deployment on three sides of Ukraine, uh, putting the um, armor, the materiel on the ground to, really do something expansive. Um, they saw it coming. They saw the military build up. I think a lot of the Russian community focuses more on Russian culture, Russian politics. And we're viewing this through the lens of, okay, well, this doesn't make sense for Russia's interests as a country. Right. Um, and just thought that there would be some kind of wily play by Putin to get, um, to get concessions. And we were not focused. We we're not focused on kind of the 
I think pretty clear in retrospect military picture on the ground, um, kind of the Chekhov's gun, I guess is a relevant, relevant case where like, you don't deploy 200,000 troops and thousands of tanks to your neighbor's border for a concession. Like that's a very serious statement of intent. Yeah. I, there's also sort of the practical matter of when you invade a country like the Ukraine, you kind of have a tiger by the tail. It's not like you're going to easily subdue right. the population, uh, you know, in the military. Bef before we move on, I want to give a quick oh. shout out to one of our sponsors on the show. I'll tell you guys about 10,000 Clothing. You can find them at 10,000.cc. Uh, they make workout clothing. I use it. Uh, I use their shorts and their T-shirts. I do a lot of like high intensity training with kettlebells and dumbbells and things like that. And uh, yeah, these are my favorite workout shorts that I've actually ever owned. So I uh, I highly recommend them. Yeah, they've They're got really uh, they've got great t-shirts, uh, workout shirts, um, hoodie. I mean, anything you want. And they they have a number of different styles. Um, they have like their tactical short, which yields a con combination of durability, mobility, and versatility. And their interval short, most vers versatile for short perfect for any workout they're really good clothes guys we're they're really we high both quality, really yeah. like them a lot and you guys our listeners can go there and go to 10,000.cc and use the promo code team to get 15 percent off your first order that's promo code team for 15 percent off your first order at 10,000.cc the brand believes better than yesterday <laughs> no zero days right so aaron um we've kind of talked about the uh as best as we're able, the some of the political machinations and sort of the psychology between President Putin and the run-up to this recent invasion that has just kicked off a week ago, uh, we saw a significant military buildup. Do we want to? Is there anything else we need to cover as far as the drivers of the conflict well, before I, we dive into the war? Itself? I was just curious in terms of was 2014 kind of a prelude to this? Was their you know incursion, their invasion of Crimea, a prelude? That's a great question. So I think like with hindsight, and there's a lot of people have suggested like this is what this is what Putin wanted all along. Like everything has been a build up to this to this point. And I I think that's that's like very easy to say in hindsight. And more importantly, I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, Putin has very traditionally been uh, kind of a great until recently great at improvising, great at the tactics, uh, great at playing the games. Um, and so 2014, kind of the, the very short story uh, revolution in Ukraine, uh, Putin thought that was orchestrated and carried out by the West. Um, it was fun to be in Russia at the time for that. Uh, people start to, started to call me State Department, uh, who they thought had plans that. Not CIA, interestingly, um, but yeah, that's, that's what they called me, Gustyev in Russian. Um, but um, yeah, thought that that was like an effort to really start profoundly kind of impeding on Russia's stomping grounds. And there was a crisis in Ukraine, new government uh, in chaos, and he had an opportunity and they had a very um, well run operation to very quickly seize Crimea. And then Putin seems got a little bit of ahead, ahead of himself and thought they could replicate that in Eastern Ukraine, uh, Donbass, the region is called, and rolled in and met more resistance than um, he anticipated. But to say that was a prelude that he had you know, kind of his eyes on seizing more all of Ukraine. I'm not sure that was necessarily true. I think he did have an interest in defanging the issue and hoping to like neutralize Ukraine as a potential threat. But I don't think that when he took Crimea, that was like his first step in seizing the whole country. Or at the very least, we don't really have evidence uh, of that. Do you think that the, the fact that our response wasn't super strong at that point in time, that that sort of gave him an idea, right, that this also, that we wouldn't respond strongly to this? I think possibly. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that the, you know, response we had in 2014 was necessarily wrong, mind right. you. Um, but yeah, I think he has a, a knack for kind of pushing and finding limits and using Russian, again, until recently, like using Russian force very judiciously. Um, what Putin did in Syria um, given that Russia has a fairly limited capacity to project power far away from Russia, to like meaningfully intervene in the conf conflict and not suffer too many casualties in the process. Like he is uh, great at kind of finding those, again, was great at, we'll get there, uh, great at finding those uh, opportunities. Um, so 
Yeah, it seems like he had quite an appetite to keep pushing and pushing um, and wasn't seeing a lot of resistance. I mean, like Russia deployed nerve agents in public in the UK to you know target um, target uh, Skripal um, and like didn't really receive that much by way of a pushback for like a pretty like, flagrant um, violation. Well, I mean, um, they, so, yeah. they used polonium, which was like intentional to sh signal who did it. I mean, it's leaving yeah. their calling card to say, we did this in, you know, the UK, and what are you going to do about it? So, yeah, um, like, again, like, I don't, I don't know if there was, would have been uh, a way we could have escalated enough in 2014 to actually make Putin reconsider. The sanctions that were passed in 2014 um, didn't really bite Russia, I think, in the way that, um, in the way that many people were hoping they might. Um, it was the, the fact that uh, oil prices dropped markedly, kind of coincidentally, that really hurt Russia. Um, so, yeah, hard to say whether if we had responded more forcefully, it might have stopped him now. But um, possibly, I think there's there. I would probably come down on the side of yes, had there been a stronger response, he may have considered a different course of action now. And I mean, what's ironic, too, is that because of 2014, NATO did go into Ukraine and start the process of modernizing their military yeah, and then, but um, I think the issue and <laughs> turning, I think, to more recent events, I think the the issue now is because because Putin, no one had really stood up to him before because the like, political consensus hadn't formed in the West. Um, he just, I think, decided it wasn't going to happen. And I think that is the kind of critical error that we've seen. So over the summer, uh, there began this, uh, the troop buildup on the border. Um, the intelligence community became concerned with what was going on there. Some of the, some of the um, people in your profession um, start taking notice as well. Um, could you walk us through sort of that buildup over the last, you know, six months or so, what, what we've seen that's kind of brought us to this point? Yeah, so it was under the kind of guise of exercises um, starting last spring. And basically the way it would work was saying, hey, nothing going on here, but we're just going to move um, a lot of um, material and assets, uh, predominantly from kind of the farther away parts of Russia from Ukraine, kind of the eastern military districts, uh, mm -hmm. central military districts. We're going to move those to the west, uh, say we're having exercises, and then uh, maybe move some material back, but uh, start to make like, a stockpile, start to leave those tanks there. Um, and this process, so there's a kind of a flurry of, activi of activity uh, in the spring and then starting again um, in the fall, really building up. And then the way it worked is that it was mostly just the materiel. And then in the kind of the week, week and a half preceding the invasion, you saw the actual manpower kind of be dropped in on all of the prepositions, hardware, um, and gradually move closer and closer to the border, while at the same time, um, Putin and Russian leaders were denying that any invasion was on the cards. And then at the same time, you have this really unprecedented uh, disclosure and declassification coming from uh, the U.S. government. We talked to uh, Mark Palomaropoulos about this when he was here a few weeks ago, um, basically trying to undercut Russia's position, trying to blow some of their invasion plans. Um, what did you make of those that series of disclosures that, you know, invasion is imminent, it's coming, you know, uh, sometimes very specific information being put out there? So it was really interesting to see people after February 16th passed, which was the kind of initial date that the invasion was supposed to start, said that, um, oh, the, you know, once again, U.S. intel was wrong. This is like Iraq. They're just trying to, you know, warmonger and war scare um, without really contending with the facts that the intelligence, I mean, look, the date may have been wrong, um, but the intelligence said that Russia had the capabilities in place to kind of launch on the go order. Um, that there wouldn't be any kind of time between that order and the time the tanks could start rolling. Um, and that was the truly concerning part. Um, so people, yeah, criticized it like, oh, they got the forecast wrong. But um, in the big picture, we're exactly right about it happening. I also think looking at it as just a forecast, it's not a political prediction. It's, it is politics in itself to publish that, um, to um, A, uh, get Ukraine uh, to take this threat seriously, to build consensus among U.S. allies, and then to uh, put uh, Putin off balance a little bit. Um, it seems to have been very good intel. I imagine that 
made more paranoia, um, second guessing. How do they know that? How is that possible? Um, so yeah, there were, there were politics involved and reports were that, uh, again, hard to know if this is actually true, but um, rumors that were that Russia did int intend to invade earlier, but um, the, the kind of disclosures may have bought more time for Ukraine because, you know, to, after all the fervent denials to invade on the day the U.S. said Russia would, would not have been good optics. That and some of the disclosures were warning of some sort of false flag attack that would precipitate an invasion. And that may have taken that tool off the table for him, too, because when the invasion did happen, Putin had this really, like, lame, half-assed statement like, well, we're going to denazify the government of Ukraine. And everyone's kind of like, what? Like, it doesn't even make sense. I think one of the really interesting things about kind of the run of this conflict is a lot of the kind of myths about Russian military capability and like yes. what Putin's good at have been like completely shattered. And it was yes. supposed to be that he's this extremely agile, you know, judo fighting chess um, player who who like is unbeatable at information wars and um, and can just outplay the West time after time. And Russia has I don't think it's even close as far as information, the information space is concerned. It's basically now seeded the field, um, just cut itself off from the world as far as communications and news go, um, just lost completely. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, to hear his to hear his denials, the fact that you know, ultimately um, there was an uptick in violence in eastern Ukraine before the, the war started that he used as like a reason to um, to. Uh, not annex, not quite, uh, but to uh, kind of declare the legitimacy of the two separatist republics in right. Donbass, recognize them. That's the word I was going for. Um, uh, recognize them. And then once the violence continued, said, OK, we need to neutralize the, you know, quote unquote, Nazis uh, in, in Kiev. And then the invasion itself does kick off um, in and it. It definitely was not the well-planned competently executed and almost bloodless operation that he launched in Crimea. It, it's like night and day and it, to the point that it makes you wonder what happened between 2014 and 2022 um, with the Russian military or with Putin in his inner circle. Um, because this invasion that, that has just happened, it seems like the most half-assed, ridiculous thing. I mean, I was t we were talking to the guys earlier, and I was saying they're performing at the level of, like, Saddam Hussein's army. Like, it's embarrassing. Um, so, what yeah, do you make? A, couple, a couple of things to say there, because that's been, I mean, almost to the point that people in the field and people who know about Russia's military way better than I do, mm -hmm. it's, it's not even like, oh, like, that's a setback. It's, people are baffled, like, what, yeah. what on earth is going on here? Um, you see, I mean, like Russian forces trying to, I mean, I think honestly, like Putin was, was counting on his, like uh, his, you know, Baghdad 2003 desert storm moment. You yeah, see yeah. these, um, you know, Russian right. paratroopers trying these like, with like thunder run. We're just gonna have like a lightly armored con. We're gonna drive straight into a city and the results are grisly. It's, it's not going well when they, when they try that. Um, and it's happens again and again. So yeah, I think there's a couple, couple factors at play. So Talking about like the internal politics, what's going on in Putin's circle, um, Putin, as I said before, getting high on his own supply, I think genuinely convinced himself that um, the propaganda was true, that like um, Ukraine had been enslaved by this this Western backed junta that uh, that was, um, you know, taking the country by force and abusing everyone, which is not not the case. And that uh, Ukrainian forces like they did in Crimea would throw down their arms and greet Russians as liberators and not, um, you know, fight with the kind of tenacity that we've, we've seen. I think the other thing is that um, this is you know, Putin's big kind of calling card in foreign policy had been like small victorious wars. So Crimea relatively bloodless um, Donbass a little bloodier, but could kind of keep that at arm's length with um, the separatist republics and soldiers on vacation Syria, Russia, you know, stabilized the situation for an ally uh, without uh, taking too many casualties, did well there. Um, Ukraine is, let's even assume Ukraine's military was not super motivated. Um, Ukraine's a, it's a big country. Mm -hmm. It's 44 million people. It, this is like a truly like interstate war. This is not 
you know, big guy versus little guy. Right. But yeah, he, he miscalculated in a lot of ways. I think one of the other critical things that he, um, he convinced himself of is, especially in Eastern Ukraine, that you know, Russian speakers in Ukraine um, would, you know, felt oppressed that, you know, they couldn't speak their native language um, and, you know, would, would, you know, join in the, join in the fray on perhaps on Russia's side or not resist. And there's always been kind of this regional divide in Ukraine between East and West, where the West is more pro-Western, East is more uh, pro-Russia. But an anecdote, actually, from my last time in St. Petersburg, uh, not after Crimea, which um, felt they felt very ethnically Russian um, and you know went, uh, went along with the invasion, I think, without too much resistance. Um, but after the events in Donbass, um, I was um, tutoring... Uh, a kid, probably like five or six in English, uh, to make some pocket change over there. And talking with his parents, who had both spent some time in the States, they were both pretty forward thinking. And one of them shared that he was talking with a friend of his in Kharkiv, Kharkov in Russian, one of the cities currently under siege in eastern Ukraine, talking with a friend there. This is 2014. This is not now. Um, an ethnic Russian, Russian speaker who said, like, I'm ethnically Russian, uh, but if Russia comes to my city in what's going on now, I'm going to take up arms. Um, 2014. So very early precursor of what we're seeing now, an indication that um, yeah, Putin miscalculated, I think, catastrophically. Yeah. I, I even had, once upon a time, I had a, a source um, who is a Spetsnaz guy, and we kind of, I haven't heard from him since 2014, um, politics and everything, but he, I, I mean, I remember him posting on Facebook at the time in 2014, like, I don't care about about invading Ukraine. Like, let them be Ukraine. Let them have their peace. He had, no, and, and he was an elite soldier in the Russian military. And this dude had no interest in invading that country. So, the kind of the traditional, like the Russian minds, and what Putin said is the term "braski narod," like a brotherly people. Yeah. So there's not really a history of animosity from Russia towards Ukraine. Now, Ukrainians will have a different story to tell you, especially in light of kind of the famine slash genocide of the 30s, um, maybe some more animosity, you know, back the back the uh, the other way around. Um, we good with the Zoom? Yeah, yeah. Go, continue. I'm sorry. OK, so um, um, but yeah, Putin kind of kind of spoke to like a lack of Ukrainian agency or lack of like Ukrainians aren't a real people, just kind of a, a, a state, but not a nation. And of course, the irony here with all the divides in Ukraine, is that by launching a, a war against the entire country has, if there was any doubt that Ukraine was like a nation, not just like a political boundary, but like one people, um, he just gave the entire country a common history. Um, he, he, he has certainly um, cemented Ukraine as a nation, not just a state. Well, well I mean, th but that, I, I mean, that was something that I thought was interesting. He said nationalism cannot be the basis of a state. Was he talking about Russia? Was he talking about Ukraine in that context? So I, I believe talking about Ukraine um, and uh, like Western Ukrainian nationalists, kind of these quote unquote neo-Nazis. I mean, the, I want to say the hysterical irony because nothing is funny about this at all, but Ukraine's president is Jewish and yeah. the quote unquote neo-Nazis in power have not tried to remove him, oppose or kill him. So like, yeah, it would be um, hard to argue that that's a, a meaningful kind of trend in Ukrainian politics. There are some neo-Nazis, um, no more than anywhere else in Eastern Europe or Russia. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's what Putin was kind of playing to like the, the idea that like Russian speaking Ukrainians were oppressed and denied equal rights and Kind of their their fair place. He's pretending, or not even pretending, genuine maybe genuinely believes that that oppression was happening, and therefore he could step in to protect Russians. Of course, the irony now that he is, you know, uh, cities like um, Chernihiv or uh, Kharkiv, R Russian speaking, um, bombing them, you know, into oblivion. Yeah. I well, it, it, you know, you have that. You have what you guys were talking about, like the the Russian casualties. But then we also have this really interesting sort of social media. It's not even really social media warfare, but it's just a byproduct of, you know, we we watched uh, some Ukrainians driving around, you know, in a Russian tank. You see the farmer burning the, you know, the eleven million dollar 
piece of equipment. Like, how is that all playing? I, I assume the Russian public isn't getting a lot of this because a lot of their social media is cut off right now. But how is that influencing what's going on? So I think that is one of the things that has been really interesting to watch is the political mobilization that's happened in the West, um, how fast it is. And so we'll talk, we'll talk about the kind of the propaganda and the kind of the view of the war specifically in a sec. But basically, before now, uh, Russian or sorry, Western politics had been very much decided at the elite level. Most people didn't have a strong opinion one way or the other. You know, we get our gas from there. They have bears and vodka. You know, think of your stereotypes. So people thought not really like a meaningful, like tangible feeling of like what it means to, 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 to deal with Russia, which means that the elites could, you know, slap Russia on the, the wrist. We're going to put some sanctions on you because of this nasty thing you did in Ukraine. Um, but, you know, business lobbies for, you know, energy, for luxury goods in Italy could lobby, lobby presidents and, you know, keep the sanctions, um, keep the sanctions from biting too hard. Similarly, you see these populist parties in Europe on the left and right being pro-Russian. The reason they could is because it's a way to show opposition to kind of the traditional consensus. Didn't really cost anything. It's tough. Putin's, you know, strong man um, and didn't really mean anything to be pro-Russia because right. it's just... For, for show. But now you see because of uh, the coverage and I think in large part because of um, Ukraine's conduct of the information war, just a real groundswell of it, you know, Russia means something now to the minds in the U.S. Sure, but especially in Europe, that's the biggest mm -hmm. shift. Um, and so when politicians in the West are saying we have to oppose Russia, they're not doing it because like they've had a change of heart. It's because the, the voting public has had a change of heart. Um, and is demanding a stronger line. And you see, I mean, the, the public polling data I've seen in Germany is, I would have to say, the, the craziest thing I've, I've seen in public polls where like, the country has decided to rearm itself and had been dead set against it for 30 years. And then the span of a week is like, okay, Russia's a threat to European security. We need tanks again. And just snap, done. Um, so there... I mean, that's a huge implication for Europe, Germany seems, being a military power again. Sweden right. and Finland talking about joining NATO, um, um, even Switzerland getting on board. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're, you're, seeing, you're seeing politics shift dramatically right before our eyes, as you said. As far as the information war uh, goes, though, so yeah, Ukraine has kind of captured, captured the kind of Western imagination with these videos of farmers dragging tanks away. I think... There's going to be kind of a reckoning. Yeah. I would. I think Ukraine has taken some pretty severe casualties too. We just don't hear about that. Right. Um, not that they're doing anything you know, wrong militarily. I mean, they're just on the subject of uh, intense, <laughs> intense and indiscriminate fire. Um, Ukraine has a very popular president who's you know well spoken, a young guy. Um, who has, again, emerged as kind of ironically, um, he was a comedian before all of this, did sketch comedy. There's a, a, a famous sketch of him um, and another member of his comedy troupe playing piano with uh, a part of your body you don't normally play piano with. Um, again, like this is maybe like 10 years ago. Uh, and then as president, a lot of Ukrainians didn't take him seriously, but has become this national hero who's rallied the country around him. But at the same time, um, he's, you know, one security slip up away from getting killed by Russia. Right, right. And right. it's but, gonna but, hit home that like, this is a, a serious war, yeah. But he's already sort of established himself in the collective memory as a, as a martyr, you know, unlike uh, President Ghani of Afghanistan, who disappears in the dead of night. Uh, this guy this seems like he's willing to go down with the ship. Yeah, and I think that makes a huge problem. I mean, Russia's long game here is is in a, they're in a really bad. It's like he's he's leading effectively, but if you kill the guy, then you have just made a national martyr. And that's, I don't think at this point uh, is going to reduce the fighting spirit mm. of of Ukraine. Um, I wanted to go back then in um, something that I noticed that I mean, clearly you picked on, up on too is that. We have imbued a lot of, in my opinion, magical qualities upon Russia um, because I guess we're over here on this side of the Atlantic. They're this faraway country with a, and we insert our tropes and our stereotypes um, to kind of fill in the blanks in our knowledge, right? 
Um, but we we constantly describe Putin as this uh, this chess master, this guy who's playing three dimensional chess and is outmaneuvering us. Um, the Russian military is seen as this strong, robust uh, sort of military that doesn't give a shit about uh, civilian casualties and will just level cities and do whatever it takes to win, right? Um, and some people, uh, wrongly in my opinion, admire a lot of this nonsense. But that said, I feel like we've seen a lot of that mythology just sort of dissolve before our eyes over the last week as we're seeing these armored vehicles stuck in the mud. We're seeing the soldiers run out of fuel and abandoned tanks. We're seeing all this kind of crazy stuff going on to the point that, as you said, even people who are experts on this subject are kind of bewildered. Like, what the hell are we even seeing here? Yeah, it's, I mean, great questions about this. I think one of the best summations I've seen on this was on Twitter, not my line. I'm forgetting who said it. So if you're watching, uh, <laughs> they can take credit. Um, but it's that it's Russia has a large modern army. But the problem is that its large army isn't modern and its modern army isn't large. There's really, there's really two armies. There's the kind of elite core, mostly contract soldiers. Um, that's about, and I, I don't know if I have the number, I want to say about 40 to 60,000. And then a much larger body using a little more antiquated equipment um, that's a lot more conscripted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that army, by virtue of the fact that Russia is ostensibly trying to seize um, a country the size of Texas um, that has 44 million people, it is using its big army, not necessarily its modern army. Um, and you can see that it's, yeah, equipment is not really performing to, to uh, as, as advertised. Uh, there was some really interesting discussions today about like what has happened to Russia's air force, which was able to yeah. be like a very effective, um, a very effective um, tool in Syria and launching you know, a precision raids and imprecise raids too on civilian targets um but like being unable to wondering like hey, can russia's air force even like run operations to like launch mass mass air attacks um and there's like a lot of questions about like the tactics that um that russia has done i mean like even like the uh, russian paratroopers the, 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 um supposed to be these invincible brutes who uh are just the the elite the creme de la creme and they've been like wiped out. There's like videos of and pretty grisly stuff of again, they're trying to like uh, drive their light tanks just down city blocks um, without meaningful infantry or armor backup and being absolutely shredded to bits. So like a lot of these kind of tropes are, are being questioned um, pretty, pretty heavily. Yeah. Well, we were talking about that earlier and Jack had brought up a really good point that, you know, Ukraine has a really robust drone program right now. And, you know, it, there should be no way they could field this many drones. Yeah, how, how, do they, how do they not have air superiority at this point is bizarre. It's, and, and this is the question, like, yes, the fact that, that, what is it, over a week, like nine days into this war, that the airspace is still contested. And this is not even like Ukrainians with, um, with Singer missiles uh, shooting down planes. These are, you know, running Ukrainian Air Force running sorties against Russian against Russian troops um, succeeding at, at, at hitting targets. Um, that is a really, really big question here. And I think it tells us something interesting about what was happening. So Zelensky in the run up to the war in a couple of weeks was saying, I haven't seen the intelligence. Um, I haven't. I, I think there's no reason to panic. Everything's going to be OK. Russia wouldn't attack us. Now, very curiously, in the initial wave of Russian strikes, um, seem not to have reduced um, Ukraine's combat power very much. So I suspect that while he was saying that publicly, uh, Ukraine's military was very, very quietly dispersing itself around the country away from these concentrated points um, and getting ready. Um, so yeah, the other, I mean, so the other thing that you've seen from uh, caps captured these captured Russians it's coming up a lot in the video of these conscripts. And in other reports that um, like the fact that the invasion was coming didn't really percolate down the chain of command until very, very recently before the invasion actually happened. Um, so you have yeah, these like horrible, like logistical snarls and, you know, uh, Russian soldiers and you know, their food getting captured that expired in 2017. Um, it seems like Putin thought this would be really quick. We're just going to roll in in a couple of days, seize power. We don't even need enough food. Um, I just didn't plan for this. Now, I think it's also worth noting, like, there's definitely half the equation, like the Ukrainians employing their their assets very, very carefully. 
Um, I think as far as planning goes, like Ukraine's general staff has been planning for one scenario since 2014. That is, I'm sure, all they've been thinking about. So, um, you know, it's not just the tenacity of regular Ukrainians and Ukrainian soldiers. I think the country has very seriously planned for this contingency for a very long time. How much do you feel, what do you th feel that the United States NATO response has gotten right? What do you feel that they've gotten wrong? Do you have uh, criticism of some of the things that, that they've done or? Yeah, so great question. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, rub anyone's feathers the wrong way. I think there's been a lot of calls for a more aggressive um, intervention. Um, and I think it's going to get increasingly political challenged, politically challenging. But the fact that we're like shooting down talk of like a no fly zone mm -hmm. or putting ourselves in a position to directly, directly fight against, um, directly fight against Russia, I think is, is prudent. Um, despite pressures to the contrary. And I think it's also been uh, prudence that we've kind of signaled that to Russia very carefully, that it's, okay, we're going to give Ukraine lots of weapons. They're going to kill lots of your troops, but uh, we're not going to be pulling the trigger. We're not going to be intervening um, in any any direct way. You also saw Russia, I think, um, blustering, talking about changing its like nuclear stature. And we saw, I want to say there was a, supposed to be a ICB, a Miniman test out of like Vandenberg, um, that we canceled just to indicate like that we're taking this seriously and that there's kind of limits to how this um, Western support will will look. So, yeah, I think it's been managed. I would have good things to say about Western governments uh, so far. Yeah. So this I mean, this kind of jumps ahead of the gun, but because you brought up nukes like what is the risk? of the results if Russia actually does succeed? And what is the risk and the results if Putin actually fails? So um, I think what I would say is that Russia, at least the way it's looking now, now the question is how we're defining success. Can Russia take Kiev? I think it would cost, you know, thousands and thousands of Russian souls to, to do that. Um, it would destroy the city. I think Russia could do it if there's the political will, um, I think it can and will happen. Uh, is Russia going to hold Ukraine easily? Um, I mean, you already see unarmed protesters in Russian occupied cities. And like, if that doesn't scream indication that an insurgency is likely, um, I mean, that, that's all the signal I need. People are, are not happy about this um, at all. So as far as like Putin utilizing nuclear weapons um like i mean a couple of scenarios have been floated okay like he detonates one in a remote area to say next one's kiev um you need to surrender um i don't know if that would make ukraine surrender they're not they're fighting for their existence as as, as a country um also i mean as far as that goes um putin really can't lose he's kind of gone all in but he does want to to take large chunks of ukraine and whatever chunks he occupy or whatever chunks he occupies, um, the, the West is not going to pay for restoration, rehabilitation of those areas. So, like, he ostensibly is going to be on the hook. So I don't right. think he wants to cause too much collateral damage. The risk is that he is really cornered, maybe domestically, maybe not about what's happening in Ukraine. Right. Maybe if there's pressure against him because of the economy and sanctions, that he'll want to try to make a, a quick end to it. But um, I, I'm not... Super. I'm concerned about a lot happening, and I think the the potential for um, an accident to lead to an escalation with the West is certainly there, and that's very concerning. Um, you know, I didn't grow up in the Cold War, and you know, realizing what it feels like to you know have like you know a plane flies couple you know couple feet in the wrong direction could like end the world. That's kind of like a scary thing to to live yeah. with. And just like, I mean, just I, mean I, I did grow up in the Cold War, you know, and. I mean, I remember like in elementary school and junior high, like we would do bomb shelter drills, you know, where, you know, you would, the whole school would go to a bomb shelter because of the, the threat of nuclear war. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I hope that, you know, we all hope that nobody ever has to go through that um, for real. Um, Guys, let me give a quick shout out to yeah. the second sponsor for the show tonight. Uh, it is Ridge. These guys make wallets. Actually, you got one there, Dave. So, yeah. So, 
they make these really nice uh, front pocket wallets, actually. They're, they're metal with these nice elastic straps on them. Uh, they come with a little screwdriver where you can loosen, loosen it up for your cards. And then basically you just, uh, this is pretty tight because I didn't loosen it, but you just basically can pop your cards in and out. It's got either a money clip or a pocket clip, whatever you want to use on the front. But, you know, it's a nice change from sitting on your wallet it's nice all the time. Too. Yeah, it's very compact, very convenient. If folks want to go check this out, go to ridge.com slash team10, and you use the coupon code team10 uh, when you go in there. D, what does that get you when you use the coupon code? 15% off. 15% off. You ah, made it extra confusing. Team 10 for 15% off. Yeah. And uh, and we just got these in. That's why we're not using them. But we're going to give them a try because I, I do I do want to get rid of my, my wallet in my back pocket. Yeah, it looks really nice. And hey, you know what, Aaron? I'll uh, I'll mail this one to you since we have a second. Well, thank you. Here. Yeah. At least what we can do for you spending some of your Friday evening with us. Happy when to. you could be out partying and living the high life. Doing cool stuff. Uh, You're implying I'm not currently partying and living. <laughs> <laughs> Are you drinking with us tonight? Um, not currently, um, but I, 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 might, I might make a move for Damn. the Scotch collection over there in a, in a bit. Okay. Let, we have some questions real quick. Um, yeah. John Pierre, thank you very much. Was this war diplomatically avoidable? Really interesting question. Um, so here's the thing. It, it seems as though if you look at um, Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, headed by Sergei Lavrov, who is a professional polit uh, professional diplomat, he's he's got chops, but he's basically since 2014 been completely neutered. Um, the kind of Russian Russia's diplomatic corps has not been calling the shots in any meaningful sense of in any meaningful sense of the word. I mean, if you look at if you look at the demands Putin made uh, to the West before the war and seems to have stuck to like the denazification of Ukraine, calling for um, NATO to remove um, all forces from like former Soviet states uh, from like West Germany. I mean, it, that's the kind of demands you make if you have Russian tanks in Berlin and you've like won World War Three, right. not after nothing happened. So, um, yeah, even I think. And if you look at Putin's aims here, like, I think there was appetite in the West to say like that. I mean, Ukraine was not going to join NATO. Um, I think there may have been appetite at least tacitly or at least for like 15 years to say, OK, we're going to delay this. We're going to even close the open door. Um, I happen to think, this is my personal view, that um, that Ukraine and Georgia should not have been allowed into NATO. And that should have been more explicit. We're not, as we can see, willing to defend either. Um, but... Yeah, Putin's aims, I mean, seem to be uh, imperial, may or may not be the right word, but I don't think we're necessarily just about NATO. I think it's about Ukraine, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, David A., thank you very much for the very generous donation. Um, thank you, Michael. Please explain the veracity of the neo-Nazi claims presence and how deep that goes or doesn't go in Ukraine historically and currently. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So let's start with the... Um, History, and then we'll bring it up to the present. So in World War II, um, there was a, and I think before World War II, uh, leading up to it, there's a Ukrainian faction called the Ukrainian People's Army, um, led by a guy, Stepan Bandera, um, based in Western Ukraine, um, nationalists. So the kind of the, the positive side, I, I don't think highly of the guy, but he was like a Ukrainian nationalists would view him as like a hero of the nation for fighting for an independent Ukraine. Um, that just happens to be on the side in cooperation with Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, in addition to fighting, again, I understand Ukraine, Ukrainians grievance against the Soviet Union leading up to World War II. I think the famine that occurred there is, is horrific crime against humanity. But yes, yeah, sided with Nazi Germany, um, were responsible for a number of pogroms and you know, horrific atrocities against Poles, Jews, uh, folks in the area. Uh, but yeah, resisted, resisted Soviet authority and um, has kind of been a venerated in uh, Ukrainian nationalist circles. Since then, you can see their flag is red and black. If you ever see that at a rally, that's the uh, People's Army flag. Um, so you have that. And then you have, um, again, following, following the fall of the Soviet Union, Again, yeah, some neo-Nazis around, no more than Eastern Europe. I think what Russia harps on a lot is the Azov Battalion, 
which is a, a far right um, far right group that uh, fought in the Donbas conflict starting 2014, was ultimately subsumed into uh, Ukraine's National Guard, um, and yeah, are basically accused of your Ukraine's government has been accused of you know providing cover for this um, for this you know, Nazi neo Nazi regiment. Um, but to say that it's pervasive in Ukrainian politics, I mean, Ukraine has had free and fair elections after the revolution of, uh, uh, of 2014, had free, free and fair elections in 2019. Neo-Nazis don't hold any seats in parliament. Full stop. Um, there's a right-wing party, radical party. Um, they're pretty far right, but they're not neo-Nazis. Um, so I think that would be the measure of kind of their lack of influence in Ukrainian society. And again, Ukraine's president is Jewish. So, right. and you see, I mean, you see now in Ukraine, I mean, Ukrainian Jews on the front lines, there's a, a picture today of like a rabbi manning, um, you know, a sandbag emplacement. So like, I would be very hard pressed to say that this is like a meaningful, heck, there's a large, very religious Jewish population in Ukraine that's still there. And um, I haven't heard incidents of, um, you know, skinheads uh, giving them, you know, meaningful problems, at least with state backing. Well, not only skinheads, but you don't see any government program rounding them up or, or persecuting them in any way. Nope. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would honestly, I guess, be like somebody invading the U.S. saying that we need to denazify because we have, you know, the far right, you know, neo-Nazis and whatnot here. Right. I mean, they're not a significant portion of our population or, or I'd, I'd argue an influential one, but. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that's a very, and again, like to say, Oh, Ukraine is, you know, full of neo-Nazis and anti-Semitic not to draw broad stereotypes, but it's Eastern Europe. Like, yes, there is anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, like right. go figure. Um, I'm not justifying it. Don't get me wrong. Right. Um, but, um, but um, yeah, it's not a meaningful kind of threat in Ukrainian society at all. And I don't think I think that's the convenient excuse for Putin and his defenders right. um, to argue. But it's it, it's it's not really about that. But, you know, if you like you said, if he isolated himself and like, you know, especially like during the Trump administration, a big message from, you know, his opponents was, you know, about, you know, anti-Nazi, neo not you know, all this stuff. And so if that if that's what Putin thinks is the rhetoric that will allow him to do this because it's 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 common verbiage right now or it was right then it, it makes sense that it would be something he would grab hold of yeah well so first of all world war ii as like a a thread in in russian society is it's it's a huge huge deal um i mean the advice going over to the study was basically like never discuss world war ii with russians um they will tell you that america doesn't understand russia's contribution uh, I don't think that's actually an unfair thing to say. Yeah. I think a lot of Americans don't. Yeah. Uh, it just so happens my grandfather was like liberated in Poland by the Red Army. And my birthday is Victory Day. Another uh, fun fact. So like I, I'm pretty well familiar, but yeah. Um, so that's like a huge thing. So to, to argue that neighboring countries full of fascists who are bent on invading Russia, that's not just like a modern threat. This is, I mean, that touches a nerve in a big way um for for you know, your average russian but the second thing is as far as like mobilizing the population and prepping them for a major interstate war of this scale it didn't happen i mean there was talk about oh like the banderites the nazis in ukraine but not that not like weeks or months of preparing russians for right um and we have an existential fight on our hands and sacrifices are going to need to be made and i think a lot of Russians, I mean, even talking to my friends, just like the, the shock over this, like, is not expected. Nobody thought this was actually going to happen. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, uh, if they're not saying it publicly, just don't don't stand for this. I don't think people actually b believe that this was actually a threat in any meaningful capacity to, to Russia. And again, a lot of Russians view Ukraine as, you know, brotherly people. This is fratricidal. Yeah. Um, Zach Egger, thank you very much. Um, what do you envision is going on in the Russian treasury this week? How long before sanctions <laughs> impact the war machine soldiers on the front line? Okay, so great question. Um, the uh, treasury, so Russia's economic policymakers tends to be very educated, uh, very, 
I don't know if necessarily pro Western, but um, like very professional. Um, and I can't imagine they're um, they're happy this week. Russia is to say in deep trouble um, is an understatement. So when I was in Russia last in 2014, um, you could get probably about give or take 33 rubles for the, for the dollar. For the last couple of years, you would get um, give or take maybe 70 to 75 rubles to the dollar. Um, as of today, I want to say it's about 125 rubles to the dollar. And this is just a change that's happened literally in the last week. So, I mean, crushing, crushing um, uh, devaluation of the currency. But it goes, I mean, so much further than that. Um, you have companies um, like Boeing, Airbus, you know, no longer providing support to, to Russia. Uh, planes being seized because a lot of um, Russia's civil aviation fleet is not owned by Russian airlines. It's, it's leased. Um, so like Russia is not going to have a functional civil aviation sector, international flights um, in like the next couple of weeks. They're going to run out of spare parts to use. Um, there's going to be, I mean, right now with sanctions um, and what Western governments have done, um, there's people complying with sanctions. We're not going to deliver parts that are military in nature to Russia. But there's also a phenomenon called over compliance, which is like think of playing um, hot potato with like a hand grenade where you have these, you know, cargo shippers, oil shippers, um, oil exports haven't been banned from Russia, but no one wants to fill an entire oil transport full of oil that may be sanctioned at any time. Right. And you're stuck with it. You just right. eat that cost. So um, Russia is selling oil, but like, no one is buying it right now. And not that it's illegal, just no one is taking that risk. So yeah, Russia is in deep trouble. I believe the question was about the military. Um, so I think there is political will and the ability to, to keep fighting. And I think Russia can keep doing that. They're moving more assets and reserves in, um, from, you know, uh, deep in, uh, Eastern Russia is the question of like, what, what is the long-term impact? So like Russia is already running out of precision guided weapons that you need. Um, you need semiconductors, advanced optics to build already running out just because of how long the war has gone on. Um, it's not going to be able to replenish those. Um, as far as Russia's programs for, you know, advanced military capabilities, um, you know, it's stealth fighters that it's developing. That's going to be a really, really painful, painful hit. And I think one of the things that um, people have said, oh, well, like Russia's just saving forces. It's going to fight NATO next. Russia's bogged. Russia can't fight NATO right now. I mean, nuclear weapons, sure, let's hope not. But um, its military is so bogged down and is not going to be able to replenish itself. I mean, it's, it's really bad. There was a, um, a video of a, a financial analyst or a funds manager who went on like Russian business TV with pretending that. it was vodka. Yeah, with um, sparkling water and gave a toast to Russia's capital market. It said, nice knowing you. It's, it's dead. Um, so, yeah, Russia's in deep trouble. And I think in the coming weeks, as like shipments of goods start to slow down, um, once Russia reopens its stock market, um, it's going to sink in just how bad it's going to get. Uh, that and that we're sanctioning the oligarchs and really going after the elite class. I mean, is that going to put increased pressure on Putin and, and the and Russian policy, essentially? Not in the least bit. And um, I think that's yeah. we think we're hitting Russia really hard in that capacity. Like the traditional oligarchs have been kind of lacking political power for years and years. So There's not been like a meaningful class that can influence Putin. And I mean, I'm sure if you ask your average Ru Russian, they said, hey, like, uh, we're seizing Roman Abramovich's, like, yacht um, in, you know, wherever it was found. They'd be like, hell yeah, like, seize, seize more yachts. Like, these, <laughs> yeah. these guys are, like, rich bastards who've, like, expropriated all of our wealth. Um, I don't think they mind. I think they're, they'd, be, they'd be in favor. Um, so I don't, think that's, I don't think that's where the impact is really going to be. I think it's going to be more on uh, consumer goods. I mean, I think the most... I can tell you based on like my interactions with Russians and friends, um, like the, the currency is going to hurt. Um, the flights are going to hurt. Um, the fact that you can't buy an iPhone in Russia anymore, that's going to really touch a nerve. I've been asked by multiple Russians traveling, you know, back and forth back in the day. Hey, can you bring me an iPhone? Bring me an iPhone. I want an iPhone. Um, it's the sudden disappearance of um, sudden disappearance of all of these kind of goods and luxury items that Russians have become accustomed to over the last 
you know, 22 years that are not going to become slowly unavailable. It's gone. Um, no Ikea anymore. Um, and that's going to that's gonna hurt uh, really bad. And the joke I've made on Twitter is that what Russia is doing right now is um, like a speed run of the Soviet Union, um, <laughs> except it starts in the year 1980 and there's no, there's no binding ideology. Um, it's just you're starting. Yeah, you're just starting. You're just it. Just there's no beliefs in anything, and you're starting, and things are already bad. So, um, yeah, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get a lot worse. Now, you said that the oligarchs don't like they they don't have any influence on Putin. I can definitely see how that would be. How much influence will they have on the people surrounding Putin, though? Um, like, could they make Putin? Un- can they can they can they threaten him existentially you know if if their wealth is at risk no and their wealth is at risk and they're unable to i think that like the only people who could meaningfully remove putin i don't think they're going to yes um are the kind of the sea they're called kind of your security elites your um shoigu um uh, zolotov who runs um uh, russia's national guard west Guardia. Um, are the only ones with like enough political capital to, to meaningfully do that. I mean, the big problem now is that Putin is all in. He like horrifically miscalculated and any step back now, other than some meaningful victory, which he has failed to achieve as of yet, is going to be like he's going to lose a, or already has, but it's going to lose a ton of credibility that like Russia's military lost a war to its neighbor. Um, he has to have something to show for it. Um, the problem is, I don't know how what he thinks he can get at this point right so i um i i hesitate to make any more predictions because i was wrong about the invasion and and i also thought you know okay now that this has happened the ukrainian military has like 72 hours to get wiped out clearly that hasn't happened um they've managed to hold out longer than i definitely thought but now my thought process is well at this point he has to bring in the big guns artillery and, and just start turning some of these cities into rubble Maybe I'm wrong about this one as well. Where do you see this going next? Where do you see this conflict hitting, hitting, uh, heading next? What are the next few steps for the Russian military in Ukraine? Because a, a, um, a, a coherent yeah. strategy does not seem to have uh, uh, presented itself as of yet. So I want to talk about two things here. Um, the first is about maps and the way the conflict is being depicted in the West. Um, you see these you know, map of Ukraine with like this like red swaths mm-hmm. over over like chunks of it that Russia has occupied. And I think that's a highly unrealistic depiction of of how Russia has actually gone about um, its operation, where it's kind of advanced along like three main axes, um, south, north, east. But it's doing it along like major roads. A lot of Ukraine, especially further north and in the east now, is too muddy. They can't even get into fields. But they haven't like pacified foot by foot, acre by acre as they've advanced along. They're kind of bum rushing major cities. And right. that was a, a huge mistake. But it's also um, left them very vulnerable um, as far as supply line goes. Basically, right. there's an article. I want to say in Wall Street Journal, you have like Ukraine special forces just running around blowing up convoys. And one of their um, operatives said, since the war started, he's lost two guys and they've killed about 60 Russians. I take that with a grain of salt. So you can say whatever he wants. Uh, right. But yeah, a lot of vulnerability there. Um, so what's next? Um, there's the um, there's the kind of the old Soviet joke. This is like don't mean to be glib, but um, like the Russian the Russian pessimist said, like man, things things are, are are horrible. Like they couldn't get any worse. And the Russian optimist says, of course they could get worse. <laughs> um, so uh, it's only bad things to come. Um, Putin's frustrated. Russia's military is frustrated, and it's not going to spur a more humane approach. The problem with that is that being more inhumane is not going to make Ukrainians back down and it's not going to make the West be more conciliatory. Right. The, like the only way for Russia is to, to keep digging, but that's gonna keep mobilizing public opinion against Russia um, and opinion to keep supporting Ukraine. So one of the things I'm looking for as far as like next steps, yeah, like Russian artillery, uh, trying to take a major city, it's going to be an absolute bloodbath. And again, I, I you say this talking about the kind of political analysis. This is there's nothing like fun or nice about this. This is going to be like horrific atrocity. The other thing I'm looking for is the beginnings of um, 
any like insurgent activity, which we haven't seen yet because Ukraine still has a standing fighting army. There's no mm -hmm. reason for there to be insurgents yet. Um, but looking for, um, yeah, partisans begin to emerge. And I think we're going to see it. And I think we're going to see it in places Putin wasn't expecting. Um, like uh, Ukraine's national divide between East, West, Russian, Ukrainian has just completely evaporated. You see uh, people speaking Russian, yelling at Russian soldiers, people speaking Ukrainian, yelling at Russian soldiers. It doesn't matter anymore. There's just no distinction uh, at this point. With with the forces seeming, I mean, as far as like even blue on blue tank battles with the Russians, like with the Russians seeming disorganized, do you do you see any type of counter offensive on the part of Ukraine? It's like, well, if we drive into Russia, let's see what they do. Yeah, like I mean, is it possible that they could win this thing conceivably? Um, and this is a, this, so this is I think where like the picture of the war we're getting. Um, is like a little slanted. Like Russia, Russia has I think failed in all of its objectives so far. It's been horrifically mismanaged. Russia was supposed to fix its was supposed to have fixed its command and control problems after the war in Georgia in 2008, where there were a lot of issues with like blue on blue incidents, and they were supposed to have fixed and it doesn't seem to have been fixed at all. Um, but Russia still like. Ukraine can contest its airspace. Russia, I wouldn't say has air superiority, but certainly has like a better, I'd rather be a Russian pilot than a Ukrainian pilot right now. Uh -huh. um, I would rather be neither right now, but I would, if given the uh, the choice, but yeah, people are, are are saying, oh, like Ukraine should should march on. And once you start getting into like mobile warfare with like tank columns, like while Russia is bottled up um, on roadways, um, I think that takes away Ukraine's advantage, which is fighting in you know, hardened positions in cities and places it knows really well. And because Russia is all buttoned up, like letting special forces run around and kind of uh, kind of uh, behind the front and causing havoc, that's working perfectly well. And it's it's not an enviable place for Russia. Every you know every day they fail to make progress um, is another day for Kiev to to dig in more to plan their defenses street by street to move. It's funny because you read on Twitter, it's frustrating. I don't know if it's funny. On Twitter, you read um, these arguments that just are like completely agnostic to logistics where it's like, oh, the West can intervene easily. All you have to do is secure these air bases and then put Western fighters there. And it's like, you can't just do that. So the case I'm making here though, is that um, moving these like anti-tank weapons and stingers to Ukraine. Right. It's the size of Texas. We're dropping them off at the Western border. It takes time to move them to where they need to go. So the longer it takes for Russians to achieve their objectives, the more ready defenders will be, the more fallback lines they'll have, the more stingers they'll have. Right. Um, so and, it's gets harder. Yeah. And you, you mentioned like the, uh, the Ukrainian special operations or special forces soldier who mentioned the 60 casualties, but, but that's nothing compared to the material and supply damage that they could be doing. Uh, like 60 soldiers, you know, not, not to be callous about it, but 60 soldiers in the view of the war is nothing. But, but, there's, but there's very real supply issues when it comes to that. When somebody can reach in your back lines or your supply lines and strike them with. We're seeing, I mean, Russian tanks are running out of gas. Um, and they're being abandoned and ukraine's got their hands on some really really like advanced russian equipment i am sure somebody in a certain three-letter agency around here in dc is going to try to get their hands on some of this equipment because these like advanced russian you know points defense systems the tor um short range anti-aircraft system i've been reading um threads and articles about how ukraine with the right technical know-how can like hack Russia's identify friend foe network for the entire entire um entire kind of theater of operations um, yeah but as far as I think there's a lot of observers in the west honestly myself included a lot of Ukrainians who would like salivate over like a doolittle raid to like send one Ukrainian MiG-29 to like drop a bomb right in the middle of Red Square not even hurt anyone but just to like demonstrate we can hit back and I think I think Ukraine understands the limitations of its forces as well. And mm -hmm. there has been talk of counterattacks. I mean, supposedly there was a, a counterattack in the East against uh, or pushing out from Kharkov um, today. We haven't heard or seen evidence of like whether that's happened or how that's gone. But I think uh, Ukraine's kind of command structure understands 
its advantages and disadvantages and yeah. pushing into Russia. I think preserving manpower material is the, the priority here, holding yeah. out as long as possible because like Ukraine has to not lose. Russia has to win. And that's right. you know, that favors Ukraine. So losing hundreds of tanks because you wanted to go on the attack, I don't think is a good tactic. I also think that it comes with managing, like managing public opinion, right? Like you don't, want to give the Russians a reason to want to go to war. Yeah. If you roll through a Russian town and bomb the shit out of it, all of a sudden it does become a national issue for Russia. And yeah. what, if, uh, what are going to be the political costs if they do roll into Kiev with artillery and you know um, maybe the Air Force shows up finally and they try to do a Syria reenactment and, and make that city look like Homs or Aleppo, um, as you said, Kiev is like the spiritual birthplace of Russian civilization. I mean, can they do that to Kiev? Is it is it even politically feasible? They're already doing it in other cities. I think maybe as a warning to Kiev. I guess the question is like politically feasible for who? Um, I think Putin has the will. I think Putin has now and Russia's locked down any like coverage of the war effort. Um, I don't think Russians would be happy to see that kind of footage. Um, there's something really powerful psychologically. These are not these are not like foreigners to Russians who are look different. I mean, look, race plays like a big role. Like the fact that the West is so up in arms about this, like part of that, and I'd be remiss not to note, like Ukrainians are white. That is mm -hmm. that is just the, the fact of the matter. Uh, Ukraine or the West wasn't up in arms about Syria. It is up in arms about you. Same things are happening, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Having a victim that looks like you has seemed to uh, make people take a, a different, different approach. Um, but it's going to certainly politically among the West. I mean, I'm sure we'll inflame people and inflame. It's not going to make Ukrainians stop fighting. And I think that's the, the problem. Um, that's the problem that Russia has is just underestimated. A has driven people to be more nationalist or patriotic in Ukraine, but also just Everyone, Russians and Westerners, uh, are just completely underestimated. So credit to the uh, the men and women of Ukraine who are, I mean, the tenacity with which they're they're holding out is 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 beyond heroic. I mean, it's it's uh, they really have their backs to the wall and they're doing better than. But it, the war's already gone on like what three times as long as it was anticipated to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ian Hutchinson, thank you very much. I find it a little funny that even in Russia, the conversation is degraded to everyone calling each other Nazis. <laughs> um, Jake, well, thank you for both those donations. I don't know if you had a question along with that, but, um, uh, and I think, oh, and Ian, Aaron's opinion on this, please. The Russians have a huge morale problem because their conscripts do not wish to be invaders. A Doolittle raid makes them defenders in their own minds. Yeah, we just kind of talked. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the word donation, if I could plug some humanitarian causes, because yeah, um, this is as good a time as uh, as any, um, just because this is uh, it's not just strategy on paper. This is you know the humanitarian crisis. So if you're looking to help out, um, two places you can go. Uh, believe it or not, Ukraine. If you look up the Central Bank of Ukraine, is taking donations um, to use for a bunch of ends. Uh, but for more humanitarian aims. Um, there's the Razum Center for Ukraine, R-A-Z-O-M. So Razum for Ukraine. Uh, if you look that up, um, you'll be able to donate there. I'll post it wanna, in the chat. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to help some folks out, uh, they really, they really, really need it. Yeah, this is uh, it, it has been horrifying, and you know, like I, you know, know somebody who has friends in in uh, in Ukraine. And so, you know, and of course, we have a Ukrainian American community here in New York City. So, yeah, it, it hits close to home for a lot of people. Yeah. That covers all the uh, viewer questions. Yeah, that, that got the viewer questions. Okay, cool. There's one more that just came in. Oh, There's what was it? From Ian Hutchinson. Oh, we just, uh, I just asked. Oh, sorry, my bad. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, how would you uh, gauge or assess the American uh, response? I mean, I, I think we talked a little bit about it and about the West, and we were talking a little bit here today. Um, from my point of view, it seems like America is for the first time kind of fighting back, 
in a consistent, uh, cohesive way that we're waging political warfare using a whole of government approach that includes information warfare, economic warfare, um, overt military aid and covert action programs in some instances. Uh, it, it's, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday uh, when they, he was telling me that in order to wage political warfare, it takes a president acting as conductor. Um, but we're also fortunate that we have a, a DCI and a DNI right now that seem to be very much on the same sheet of music. Yeah. Um, I think the, I think that you certainly from Washington has been managed. Well, I think the, the real sea change though is, um, and I think the, the kind of the change that's going to have the biggest political implications going forward is not in the United States at all. It's Europe. Um, seeing a consensus emerge very rapidly that European leaders, a, as far as military spending is going, but also even like their, their statements, um, saying that like our partnership with Russia can't be centered around trade anymore. Like trade is good, uh, business partnerships are change. Um, and I think we'll continue to play a key role. Interesting, you have um, the chancellor of uh, Germany, Olaf Scholz, um, part of, there's, he's responding to political pressures domestically, but part of what he reportedly said is that he felt that in the negotiations in the run up to the war, that um, Putin personally lied to his face um, and Look, there's domestic politics. There's a lot of you know, factors in international relations, but personal relationships really matter. I mean, look at Clinton and Yeltsin. There's a million and one examples. And the fact that Putin has torpedoed his relationship with the German chancellor is one. You've still seen uh, Macron in in Germ or sorry in France um, trying to keep lines open to kind of maintain the image of like Europe's diplomat and you know key leader in that uh, that capacity. But yeah, the fact that Europe has taken a hard line has more ability to hurt Russia economically than anything America could do just because of geography proximity. Yeah. What do you think countries, you know, like Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, you know, the, these former Soviet countries, how do you think they're sort of viewing this whole thing right now? Uh, with, um, they're not happy about it. Um, and there's nothing they can do. Um, they're very dependent on Russia economically. And kind of tethered to, uh, I mean, the sinking ship may be too dramatic, but tethered to a country that is going to have a ton of hardship very, very shortly. Um, their currencies are uh, related to how the ruble does because of the economic, you know, binds uh, between them. Um, you know, a country like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, they have a little bit of leeway because they can produce you know, oil, and natural gas. So that will help a little bit. Um, so they need to pretend to like be friendly with. Um, pretend to be friendly with Russia to go along. Um, Armenia, I, I saw it may or may not be true that they actually had sent some soldiers to Ukraine. I don't think there's any bad blood between Armenia and Ukraine, but like Armenia is wholly dependent on Russia as a security protector. They don't have a, don't have a choice. I don't blame them for you know, what they're doing in their position. Maybe some of the Central Asian countries will start to look more towards China as a more reliable partner that's a little more judicious about how it uses force playing a long game, um, not trying to, you know, kick off interstate wars on a large level um, and get, you know, get them into trouble because of it. But yeah, they're going to, they're going to have a hard time too. Now, um, you know, oh, sorry, please. I, I was just going to say, Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> sorry. 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 Um, there's like a lot of central Asian migrants in, in Russia who some of whom have Russian passports and the kind of advice is being, you need to leave the country. Now you'll get drafted. Wow. So, Aside from the economic issues, do you think that they worry about sovereignty issues in the sense that Putin is maybe viewing this as building a new Tsar, you know, a, a new, a new, not a new Soviet Union, but a new empire? Um, I think, I don't think that's like on the cards yet, but I think especially in Kazakhstan, which in its kind of northern territories has a fairly large ethnic Russian population. Um you saw an article in like the Russian news um, about how like there's issues in Kazakhstan too with the Russian minority, how, you know, they made they need better rights, something along that line. Um, I think that's the particular worry for Kazakhstan. And I think it just opens, um, opens a can of worms in a way that like you, you can't, or Pandora's box, maybe better, better metaphor Like you can't close that in a similar way that to, again, not making this about a value judgment on U S politics, but like, when Trump 
floated the possibility that U.S. might not play a key role in NATO, um, even though you know he was voted out. Like that. That possibility, you can't close that box. Europe heard that, and that is now something that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and now Kazakhstan, you know, um, Russia has invaded a neighbor, a large country with an ethnic Russian population with the intent of uh, potentially conquering and annexing large chunks of it. And that's, that, that's never going to go away. That is now something that is, like, believable and possible. No, that's fascinating. Um, let's see here. Uh, Hassan said we missed his previous question. I didn't see it. Did you guys see it? No. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find that. Uh, we'll find this on, um, uh, Zach, uh, thank you. If Putin needs to create a diversion elsewhere in the region to pull our eye away from the UKR, what are the most likely places he'd go? Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina with the Serbs, um, I think he has an ally and the, the leader of it's a, like a binational republic. There's a lot. I'm not a Balkan specialist, um, but um, there's a leader there, Dodik, um, who has tried to basically break up the federation and turn the Serbian half of the country. I don't know if it's half and half. Don't quote me on that. Um, into its own state, um, and um, he's been making moves that way. And if I were Putin and looking to cause trouble and distract Europe um, in the Balkans, particularly. Uh, would be where I would do it. Uh, great. And uh, hold on, sorry. Um, uh, thank you, British guy 101. <laughs> uh, do you think that Western governments will be willing to recognize, arm, and support a Ukrainian government in exile? Interesting question. Um, and I, I would just like lead that off because I, I'd um, point out that from a legal standpoint, we are now arming and supporting the lawful, legitimate elected government of Ukraine. If that government collapses, now we're moving from uh, from one thing to another, and really we'd be moving into you know Title Fifty covert action entirely. Um, there'd have to be like a presidential finding and all sorts of stuff to, th to then sponsor an insurgency. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think, Aaron? Um, so, I mean, you can look at that from like the broad perspective, like the hall of NATO, um, but it doesn't even have to be the hall of NATO. Um, let me tell you if, you, if if I could think of a group of people who would want to stick it to the Russians, even without France and the U.S. going along, Poland is right there on the border. Um, they've got a lot of bad blood and I think would be fairly... Um, fairly overt about it. I don't think they'd even need to do it. I mean, covertly to sneak across the border, depending on who's controlling what. I think the future, uh, like what does Russia want to keep? What is Russia going to do with Ukraine if it takes all of it? It's a, a, an open question, but I think Poland would fairly openly have no qualms about sponsoring a government in exile, uh, funding an insurgency um, whatsoever. Um, and I think, I mean, part of the issue now that Putin has is that, um, yeah, people were operating, oh, like, oh, my God, Russia's military is going to come for us. Now we're seeing, you know, the full effect of that after a year of planning, not being very effective. And I think that's lost Russia credibility to, like, scare states in its neighborhood um, about, about, you know, the consequences of funding and insurgency. Even uh, if Russia wins, they kind of lose in this because they're going to be saddled trying to govern and run a country that absolutely hates them. Right. Yeah, I, I actually, and that a, a country they will have blown large chunks, uh, large chunks of blown to pieces. Right. Uh, I actually missed quite a few questions. Uh, thank you, Leon. Uh, what about the accountability for weapons that are being sent to UKR, like and law stingers, etc.? Seems like these could disappear, pop up in other places. Possibly. Um, I think there's less of a risk for for now, um, just because there is still like a command structure with Ukraine. Um, it certainly is a possibility. I don't want to, to discount that. Um, but I, I don't view that as like a particularly concerning risk for now. I mean, like people are saying, oh, foreign fighters are coming to Ukraine, but these are not like Afghan Mujahideen here. These right. They're not going of, to like a, a guerrilla or insurgent, a guerrilla force or an insurgency. They're going to a formalized military. You do have Chechens um, against the leadership of Chechnya who have a you know, very hard <laughs> insurgency history um, turning up in Ukraine to fight against other Chechens who do Cataracts, support. guys, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so um, they're there, but yeah, I don't like, it's possible. I just don't think of that as like a particularly proximate yeah. risk. Um, in technic, thank you. Uh, Jack, what happened to that bet that Putin wasn't evading? Did it go double or nothing? It went double. I owe my friend like, a pretty expensive bottle of scotch. <laughs> Um, Pablo, thank you very much. Where do you find the war footage? Everything I've seen, like Ghost of Kiev, is fake. It seems uh, the war with less footage than Vietnam. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm just looking at my uh, phone for a second. There's a there's an account. Um, I have to make, maybe I have to find it later. But um, on Twitter, if you're looking um, for news, there's a lot of uh, a lot of war footage that is not just like rumors that you actually can see what is happening. The one thing is that, and I will again make this caveat that we're not seeing like war footage from the Russian side. None of like the videos of drone raids um, that we saw in Syria, I think because Russia was hoping to like be soft at first and not turn too many Ukrainians against them. But yeah, we haven't seen that like propaganda effort, but yes, yeah. all over Twitter, um, Reddit slash combat footage. Um, if you're looking, um, they have stuff there. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, it's around and it's I, not just rumors. It is the, the real thing. I wrote an article this week. Um, I can bring up the title for you, but I think it's just inside America's javelin program to arm the Ukrainian military. And I spoke to someone who was involved in that program from an office in the U S government. And, uh, but anyway, kind of got, got the inside story on that. And, um, yeah, the javelin systems are over there. They're being used. And and then when I posted the article, because I, I had um, some estimates that a source gave me of their performance. Like 90%, in combat, right? In combat. Like, yeah, uh, he, he, the estimate was about 280 hits out of 300 fired, yeah. which in the Debeka Pass in 2003, uh, 10th special, or I'm sorry, 3rd Special Forces Group fired 19 of these systems uh, for 17 hits. So, like, the statistics aren't out of whack. I mean, it's a very effective system. Um, but then, of course, people get it into the comments, uh, the, the open, in, open source intelligence people debating amongst one another, like, oh, if... And I went through this with Syria, too. There are people out there who believe if you don't have a video of a rebel shooting a tow missile, then it didn't happen. Um, and I think there's a role for open source intelligence, absolutely, and I don't discredit that off, off the cuff, but... As you point out, we're not seeing all of the footage, right? We're not. There's a lot of things happening on the Russian side um, that we're not seeing. There's a lot of things happening behind enemy lines we're not seeing. And it is possible that on social media we create our own little echo chambers. Um, and, and a lot of the cheering on we've done of the Ukrainians and their heroic fight, while that's warranted, um, we may be looking through you know rose-colored glasses there too. A little bit. But it is also, I mean, interesting to see all these, you know, these though it's frustrating, the military comparisons. What if like one missile was fired at one tank? Like how would the war go? And it's like, that's not how wars are fought. But yeah. like we are seeing that Western, you know, anti-tank systems like can do the job against most of the tools that the Russian military has. And I think there's people in Moscow who are probably concerned to be seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just like a hypothetical matchup anymore. And again, with all of the Russian hardware being <laughs> not even like, taken out in hostile action, just like left on the field. Again, yeah. I'm sure there are people down here in my neck of the woods salivating to get their hands on on some of uh, this armor, some of this tech. Aaron, you mentioned Twitter. Where, where can people find you on Twitter? Because I know you've yeah. been following the war quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, tweeting about it incessantly. I need to get, need to get off. I need to take some time off after, after all this. Um, but it's um, Aaron underscore S-C-H-W-A. So just the uh, first few letters of my last name. Uh. Um, and... That's where you can find me. Aaron, S-C-H-W-A. So Aaron underscore S-C-H-W-A. Okay, great. That's me. Um, Hassan, I found your question. Uh, thank you. Any validity to the so-called biolabs producing bioweapons and giving Putin more another reason to evade <laughs> or just more internet propaganda? Uh, more internet propaganda. Okay. Um, we got Ian's... All right. Yeah. If we got most of the questions, I think our Patreon users had some questions, but we do that for the bonus segment. Uh, yeah. Um, for, yeah, for Paul, uh, thank you. Does it seem like Sweden and Finland will join NATO? If so, how is oh. Putin likely to react? He's not going to be happy. Um, 
there were some meetings today with Biden. I want to say it was the Finnish president uh, was in town and they talked about security guarantees um, between like the US and NATO and Sweden and Finland. I get the sense, first of all, this change in public opinion is new. I think they probably want to have like a referendum on it or some more formal public indication that the public wants it to you know, make it look legitimate. I suspect, and I have no reason to believe this, that Biden told, made it clear that like, they are considered, and I think as far as your, like, European uh, defense architecture and NATO defense architecture, they're pretty closely tied in. Mm-hmm. Um, they're coming to the NATO meetings now as observers, but they're, they're there. I suspect Biden told them, like, we don't want to antagonize Russia more than we need to right now because we can just give them a huge bloody nose um, in Ukraine. Um, but maybe to hold off for a while while we will extend the security kind of guarantee. Like, you're basically part of the alliance. It's just we're not going to make too much noise about that. I suspect. I don't have any evidence to, to suggest it, but my hunch. And let me see. Um I don't know if anything else is coming in. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of people very interested in this stuff. Um, so we got that. Uh, <clears throat> Michael, thank you very much for the donation. He says, hey, everyone, happy to be here and crack in a beer with the team house. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Aaron, any final thoughts before we wrap up here? Um, if it's cool, I'll ask you to stay for like 15 minutes for the bonus segment. Yeah, of course. Thank you, man. I really appreciate all of your insight here and that we're able to have sort of an adult conversation in a longer format about this conflict, uh, which is it's really important to have those conversations right now. And, and, you know, you lending your expertise is super helpful. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, And again, um, Ukraine Central Bank, um, if you're looking to uh, looking to help out again, let's not lose sight of the. uh, humanitarian implications here uh, we yeah, can we're gonna throw we can help out and make a difference the, we're gonna throw all the links in the description yeah we'll yeah. put the links Perfect. down in the description yeah uh and i did put some links in the chat um i there's uh there's one last question from pablo uh i don't know if you know this is in your wheelhouse um what do you think of biden buying oil from iran instead of u.s going energy independent um so uh, Yes, I think there's the kind of two factors here. So, um, like the oil market is global, so it's it's really just that you get the prices for different kinds of blends. You have your like West Texas Intermediary, um, Brent, Urals is Russia's blend. So, um, if Iranian oil comes back onto the market, if there's a deal in Vienna in like the next, I believe, week, that will bring down global prices, which I think will be good for um, a lot of countries. Um, I think this is does have implications for well, some implications for the U.S. We were not importing a ton of Russian oil to begin with, um, and I think the march towards energy independence is going to continue regardless. I think it's good politics now for Biden. You know, Joe Manchin wants to do it, and Biden is inclined to make Joe Manchin happy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's for Europe where that's going to really, really matter, and the fact that Europe has realized, okay, like. The fact we depend on Russian energy for our hydrocarbons, oil and gas, um, that's a huge political liability. And we need to turn that turn that dependence off as fast as we can. So that's where I'd be like really keen to see. I know Europe's gonna be releasing a strategy about like how they're gonna wean themselves from Russian energy. But that's that's the big implication here. Do you do you do you feel as though there are uh pitfalls with you know, not necessarily depending on for anybody, but for utilizing Iranian energy, or do you think that it's kind of, it can be a carrot for Iran in order to sort of maybe bring them more into the world stage and, and normalize relationships with it? Relationship so with it? caveat that I am not an Iran specialist. Sure. Um, I would probably not call myself a hardliner on Iran, particularly. I don't have any love towards the governments there, um, but um, I just don't view it as, you know, in as threatening a capacity. I think, okay, well, this is just completely my political opinion. This is, you know, not not academic here, but I, I, I think the U.S., and I think, it, interestingly, okay, keep talking about this. There's so many more topics that can, that can emerge here. Um, some of the Gulf states, you know, Saudi UAE have been like a little more conciliatory towards Russia through all of this, I think because they view the U.S. as playing less of a role in the Middle East, I don't think that's a bad policy. 
um, for us to be doing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't take a ton of issue with allowing more Iranian oil back in the market. I think like the pressure that's going to be against sanctions in the West is because energy prices are, are going to rise and people are going to be unhappy. So if we can keep um, energy prices down and pressure on Russia up, that's kind of the ideal politics from a Western standpoint. Dave, could you uh, pass me that book laying down there? For next episode, we're going to have journalist Matthew Cole here talking about his book, Code Over Country, that just came out about SEAL Team 6. Um, I've been going through here making copious notes, and there is a lot of very spicy content in this book. Um, next episode is going to be interesting. It'll be spicy. Yeah. Um, and it, Anyway. So check out Aaron. Check out the charities he mentioned. We're going to put the links down in the description. There's also a link down there to our Patreon page. Uh, if you guys want to support the show, we really appreciate that. And um, – that's it. I hope everyone has a good Friday. Check out 10,000 Clothing and the Ridge Wallet. And Aaron, again, thank you so much for taking some time out of your Friday night to, to talk to us tonight. Absolutely. And for pleasure. those of you who are members of our Patreon, you get to hear some of Aaron's crazy stories in Russia. Or maybe something else. I don't know. Um, but anyway, yeah. Hey, we want to thank you all, uh, A, for watching, B, for liking and subscribing. Please do that if you haven't. Hit that little bell for notifications. Um, and especially for our Patreon supporters, you guys keep the lights on and keep us in the booze. So we, we definitely appreciate you guys. Um, but we love you all.